Hi all, I hope you're all having a good Christmas. Have you celebrated Christmas? If not, I hope you're having a good holiday anyway and you're going to have a good new year when it comes. Uh, let's go over a game. We haven't had a video for a few days. Um, in the first round of the London Classic, there was a very interesting game by um, Grandmaster Michael Adams. Uh, so he was playing David Howell. And um, it kicked off with E4 by Michael Adams. E5. And it's it's as though Black wanted to play a super solid um, opening system now. Uh, where black takes on e4 so this is the Berlin defense uh, which Kramnik used to successfully de defeat um, Kasparov in, in a match in, in the brain games um, world, world championship match which wasn't a FIDE world championship match it was um, it was the offshoot of, of an offshoot of FIDE which um, anyway the Berlin became very popular because of Kramnik's usage, but um, in this game it didn't seem that solid because I think Black um, deviated kind of early uh, on after d4. Uh, perhaps uh, knight d6 is, is more solid than the game continuation. There was a very interesting uh, thing that happened now. Uh, Queen e2. We're, we're not really on the mainline Berlin territory at all now. In fact. This knight is, is heading to be Fianchettoed on b7 fairly soon, as we're about to see. Uh, knight d6, so white, uh, Michael Adams, he took on c6, and then we have this d takes e5. Now, David Howe says he, you know, he briefly looked at this a few weeks back and, um, thought he'd give it a try. Um, it doesn't intuitively inspire too much confidence unless the knight's going to like reroute back in the centre maybe. But um, in this game, it, it seems to be a more materialistic knight, and uh, was seemingly punished. Uh, Black was punished for materialism at the expense of white dominating the centre, and in, in, in particular, you know, was able to generate a good kingside attack from that. Um, so c4. Now Black castles. Knight c3. Now f6, as though Black's you know going to get some counterplay on the f file, but uh, look at this. Uh, there's some congestion issues here, which is always a bad sign if you're playing Black and you've got the Queen's bishop still stuck on c8, and in particular it's blocked in by the Fianchetto knight at the moment. So um, may maybe you know White's got uh, an edge here. Rook e1, not minding Black generating seemingly some some dynamism on the f file. Um, f takes e, queen takes e5. Okay. Well, at least it looks like two pieces are, are active in the inverted commas. These two are active. But a queen g3 pointing at, at the black king is kind of uncomfortable pinning that pawn. You know, potential threats of bishop g5 or bishop h6 or knight g5 looks a bit unpleasant. This occupation of the e file as well looks pretty dangerous for black. Uh, but knight c5 looks like a promising move. But the continuation now is 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 strange. Um, Bishop g5, and uh, David uh, went too much on an adventure here, expecting maybe um, after this next uh, knight move that White would just simply um, play Rook e2. But there was a nasty surprise here uh, for Black. Uh, Mike Williams played Rook e3, so that's a very interesting um, distinction here. Um, you know. There's a bit of a tactical liability here with knight b2, so the rook actually supports c3 intuitively, but also maybe can be useful for rook f3s later if white generates an attack. So black went in for knight takes b2. Remember, the knight's now protected by the rook on e3, and white now just play rook a e1. So this looks like a big positional sacrifice for a pawn, but look at you know black's queen side development. These double pawns, you know, the, the, the white pieces are all in nice positions here, ready to spring uh, an attack. Use this domination of the e file, in particular. So um, black took here on g5, so that's one active piece gone. So um, knight takes g5, and already there, there are big threats in this position. Uh, you know, if knight takes c4, there's queen h4 hitting c4 and, and h7. So this is already looking pretty pretty bad. Now um, David Howe said in the post mortem, you know, he was just putting on a straight face. He knew something had gone horribly wrong here, and was just trying to you know play his best from this position. But it looks very very dangerous. Um, the threats because White's actually threatening you know in a lot of lines, knight h sevens and and knight e fours to g fives. You know queen h four. It's simple dangerous stuff on h seven, bringing all the pieces into the attack. 
Um, so here, uh, this artificial looking move, queen f6, the queen you know can be um, attacked now with this rook f3 move, which, by the way, I, I correctly predicted in in the uh, commentary room. I mentioned uh, there's rook f3 here, and it's kind of dangerous because it's removing one of the defenders of, of the black king, and the queen you know hasn't got too many useful squares to go to. It just retreats back, which is a bad sign as black. Um, having to do a queen retreat like this uh, with, with your pieces not really developed this usually just spells that you're going to lose the game uh, so knight c e4 just kindly bring another piece into the attack with threats like knight takes h7 knight g5 check you know queen h4 with with menacing threats against the black king so black finally moves that queen side bishop but it's all a bit late the attack's crashing through now my credence played just knight takes h7 and this is all a bit nasty um so uh black took on f3 but it, it it does look as though the position's completely gone the queen doesn't have to move here my credence actually accepts double pawns um that's the least of um black's concerns actually because um basically there's a raging attack and, and knight f6 is, is kept as a threat if the queen's on g3 for example so g takes f3 is, is a logical move for the position and you know the, the knights and queen are really really uh, coordinating well here king takes h7 and now there follows check and now this this very aggressive queen h4 so simply going to drive the king towards the center where it's um, in real trouble Black uh, snatches another pawn with bishop takes c4, and now we have this vicious combinatory attack, queen queen h7 check. Um, but now not not uh, queen h8 check, which you know maybe black can fight on, um, or maybe, maybe that's winning as well. Bishop g8 doesn't look too hot, but um, you, you could imagine you know maybe queen. Um, not knight h7 king f7 i can't see an immediate mate but uh this this continuation seems a lot stronger that uh, michael played now he just swung his rook in uh via that e file with next move rook e5 so with a nasty threat of of rook f5 and in in, in the lines now queen h8 check bishop g8 rook f5 is gonna it's gonna be really annoying so bishop e6 by now the king is driven to the center check um now check here the bishop's now pinned not too many squares of king eight queen f7 mate after king d6 um i hope you can spot the final move if i give you five seconds okay it was knight e4 mate so that was a bit of a crushing defeat of Paul Paul David, who's a really nice guy actually, as we saw in the, in the interviews at the end of the tournament. He, he just suffered really a bad opening. It just shows, you know, even if you're a really strong player, if you get a bad opening position against another really strong player, then you're in real trouble. And even if you know you're attempting to play the Berlin, you have to play it like with with accuracy, I think. And um, actually, I I might mention at this moment. Um, from the last video of of one of Piggott's great wins in in the uh, in the league, um, he he was interested in this concept of earning laziness. And he he mentioned Michael Adams as an example of such a player who might uh, spend a lot of time more in the critical positions, but otherwise playing um, more positionally throughout most of the game. And he, he called a different approach, which you might want to consider as a sort of maximalist approach, where you you just try and make effort on every move but um the the minimalist sort of lazy approach is, is something which um is characterized by some grandmasters in in his opinion he mentioned michael adams and so maybe maybe this game is interesting that um you know a lot of the game is, is standard positional moves but that there are certain situations in this game where where killer punches and great precision was required to carry on the attack but there was a logical flow to the attack i thought that white was getting all the resources in you know uh, it was a, a principle to attack. Someone asked, "What? What do I mean by principle?" You know, getting the, the knight in. You know, make sure that um, you know, even if you miss something, you've still got more pieces to bear on the opponent's king. So sometimes, you know, maybe you know, less precise attack, but um, we're, we're bringing in more resources can't can't usually be a bad idea in, as a generalisation. So white got all all the resources in. You know basically in, into the attack against the black king it seems you know f6 does have a side effect of slightly weakening black's uh, king's side 
um, you, you know the, these two pawns are not as strong as the free pawn the h7 is a bit vulnerable um, but I think one of the key ideas I mean this was a nice move as well bishop g5 sort of freezing black's position a lot you know stopping rook e8 because you know takes and bishop f6 and you know black's in, in trouble already and has to play very very carefully so this this materialism just ex accentuated white's positional trump cards uh, really and this this domination of the e file and you know white not having to waste time supporting c3 now uh, you're just sacking that b pawn and um, the attack see, seemingly you know was a very fluent attack was seemingly playing itself but there were some key moves here um, so notably like knight c e4 you know getting getting all the resources in uh, for this knight takes h7 I mean in the contrary when we're looking at mazes of variations and the, the simple and effective thing which which Michael Adams played, you know, getting getting his queenside knight into the attack is is really just as m more decisive and clear cut than anything we, we'd looked at. But um, it was interesting. My, Michael said in the, in post point he, could, he couldn't actually see anything totally clear for a long long time. Uh, so maybe it was here finally. He you know he looked at he found this this resource you know that he would need in this position. <coughs> Pardon me. Of, of bringing in the, the rook um, in, into this attack um, with this 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 key move here, this rook e5. So that was a really crushing move, rook e5. So queen f6, rook f5. Um, you know, screwing the queen. The king's kind of trapped, just waiting. You know, for horrible queen h8. So um, bishop e6 was just a token uh, defensive move, really. So just going into this this mating net. Um, so yeah, I hope. Well, maybe there's something instructive in that, and also it touches on this idea that you know maybe you know playing accurately in critical positions is, is something certain GMs um, do. Also, I, I, I um, John also mentioned in the opening sometimes it's very important to be very very careful uh, not to miss anything because it can be quite destructive. I guess because the complexity of the position in, in the openings is such that um, you know if you do play something inaccurately. Um, you know, you, like like this game shows. You know, you can you can be the subject of a vicious attack. Anyway, um, hope you're having good holidays, and um, hope you enjoyed this a little bit. This video, um, comments or questions on YouTube. Thanks very much.